The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, could the solution to pain, inflammation, and other issues be found through acupuncture? It has been proven to help. It's not as crazy as it sounds. There's a real push on what else we can do. CBN News shares the science behind this technique. Then, the Duck Commander himself, the patriarch of the Robertson clan, weighs in on the battle for America's soul on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, in the Bible, there's a statement about uh, oppression. It said, women will rule over you and children will be your oppressors. And I, I look at this guy, Beto O'Rourke, you know, and everybody think, well, Beto, Beto, Beto. What has he done? We're talking about the possibility of a man like that being elected to run a $20 trillion economy. And what did he do before? He was a nanny for it. Wasn't he a nanny? He looked I, at, I don't know. I think he looked at the little babies. I mean, isn't that wonderful? And you've got this woman, this uh, Okajic, whatever they say, <laughs> OAC, what OAC. I mean, the stuff they're coming out with is such insanity. And she says, well, we're going to do away with air travel in, in 20 years or 10 years and so forth. I mean, it's just crazy. And I, President Trump said very wisely, can you imagine taking a train to Europe? I mean, it just doesn't work that way, you know. But I mean, it, it's incredible. But and, don't you find it equally incredible that the press follows them and gives yeah, credence to they're that? They're giving them credence to all these statements, and huge crowds come out to hear this guy whose whose total career uh, accomplishments has been sitting around in New York, not doing anything, and then being a nanny. I mean, come on. This is a huge economy. Nobody would hire somebody to run a major corporation who doesn't have any experience. And we seem to think that we can put in somebody with no experience who's 25 years old, never done anything, and we somehow think well, they can run the country. They can't. They just can't. And it's time we wake up to the fact of what's going on. Okay. Now, there's a border wall. The president uh, apparently is not going to shut the government down. It would be a tragedy. And the congressional leaders say that they may have got a deal. Well, the deal is they're going to get about a billion uh, and a half, a, a billion 370 or something like that. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll build about 50, what is it, 200 miles of border fence. Yeah, maybe. And maybe some money will be found. Yeah, well, they think there may be that. some. But uh, both sides on this one are claiming victory. And we're going to find out what some of the people behind the scenes are saying as we cannot have another government shutdown. Well, despite the fact that it looks like maybe we won't, there are still hurdles to overcome. The agreement first has to pass the House and the Senate, and so far President Trump hasn't given any clear signal that he'll support it. Mark Martin has more. President Trump acknowledged the breakthrough in negotiations at his rally for border security in El Paso last night, but gave no clear signal he'll support it. Negotiators reached a deal in principle late Monday night, emerging from a closed door meeting with the news. They agree it's not perfect and not everyone will be happy. Not a single one of us is going to get every single thing we want, but nobody does. It only includes about $1.4 billion for border barriers and not the $5.7 billion President Trump wanted. But the Democrats did back down from their demand to limit the number of detentions by ICE. The president trashing that initiative at his rally. If we cut detention space, we are cutting loose dangerous criminals into our country. A potential rival for the president in 2020, El Paso native Beto O'Rourke also held a rally in El Paso, challenging the president's border wall. The U.S. cities of the U.S.-Mexico border are far safer than the U.S. cities deeper in the interior of the United States of America. Some conservative lawmakers are already criticizing the deal. Representative Jim Jordan tweeted, while the president was giving a great speech, Congress was putting together a bad deal on immigration. Now it remains to be seen if the president agrees. Mark Martin, CBN News. Well, I say it before, I say it again, we cannot shut the government down. We can't do it. And we also can't screw up the credit of the United States when we fail to raise the debt limit. 
So all this is facing Congress. Well, Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson is joining us now. And on Monday morning, negotiators were negotiating, apparently were dead. And now they say they've got a breakthrough. What is it? <laughs> well, as you said, if there's one thing that all lawmakers on Washington agree with right now, it's that there cannot be another government shutdown. And they are working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Over the weekend, we heard that negotiations were failing, that it, we were not going to see come, some kind of deal. But that really is not an option. Lawmakers have put their faith in these 17 members of the conference committee that's bipartisan and bicameral, and they have to figure something out. And apparently, as of late last night, the members of those committees say they are cautiously optimistic that they have reached some kind of compromise that they believe will pass both the House and Senate and hopefully be signed by the president. Well, there's some conservatives you're criticizing them right off the hit in the deal and some of them don't even know about. Uh, who have you talked to about this? Well, we know uh, last December, President Trump said that he was going to sign the bill that passed the Senate that would have prevented the government shutdown. And then he heard backlash from people like Sean Hannity and a lot of conservative lawmakers and a lot of his base saying not to do it, that the, the wall needs to be built. And we've already heard from some conservative lawmakers like Jim Jordan that he does not like what he's hearing is in this conference committee bill so far. And we also heard Sean Hannity call the bill garbage last night. But what I think is the most likely scenario is that President Trump will sign whatever bill comes out of this conference committee so that he will keep the government open, but that he will then find another way to build the wall, whether that's through declaring a national emergency or finding funds through the Department of Defense, finding, finding other funds that he can use to build this wall. And the President Trump pretty much confirmed that last night at his rally in El Paso when he said that no matter what the conference committee bill includes for the wall funding, they're going to build the wall anyway and they're going to get it done. Well, you know, the, the sticking point that everybody was complaining about was that the Democrats uh, uh, wanted limited attention and less mm -hmm. beds. And so they did cave on that one, didn't they? Well, I want to point out that it's since we have not seen the final bill, it's not confirmed that they have caved on that. Democrat Congresswoman Nita Lowey, who's on the conference committee, she was asked by MSNBC just this morning about that issue, and she said everyone should just wait and see what is in the final bill. So we don't know for sure that they did give up on that fight, but that is the issue that almost derailed this entire agreement over the weekend. Democrats on the committee were apparently requesting that that the number of beds in ICE det detention centers be decreased by 20 percent so that it decreases the number of undocumented immigrants that ICE can detain at a time. Republicans who heard this said, no way, absolutely not. And so they apparently what is being reported right now that we know of in the current bill is that that they did cave on that and that will not be included. But I've also heard that even if that number is decreased maybe not by 20 percent, but even a little less than that, that ICE has other ways of getting funds for those beds when they need them. So hopefully it's, it's not an issue that derails this negotiation. Abigail, thank you very much. Uh, thank and, you. You know, there's another member of Congress. You know, they had a, a Republican from out in uh, Iowa who said some unkind thing about minorities, and they literally stripped him. He talked about white power and so forth. They stripped him of all his committee assignments. Well, as a Muslim member of Congress, she's apologized for making anti-Semitic comments on Twitter. And Democratic leaders pressured Representative uh, Imam Omar uh, to take back her remarks. But as Gary Lane reports, it's not the first time the Democrats have had to deal with her controversial tweets. Republicans were quick to jump on Omar's comments that support for Israel in Congress is bought by campaign donations. They say it's another sign that the Democratic Party is trending away from Israel, and its leaders are being forced to deal with the openly anti-Jewish sentiments expressed by its Muslim members. On the CBN News program Faith Nation, Neil Strauss of the Republican Jewish Coalition explained why Omar's anti-Israel tropes were actually anti-Semitic. This goes into the anti-Semitic trope of Jews using their money to control um, our world's politics, our, our nation's politicians. The firestorm forced Democratic leaders to deal with Omar's openly anti-Jewish comments. 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi called on her to apologize, saying anti-Semitism must be rejected in all forms. In her apology, Omar said, anti-Semitism is real, and I am grateful for Jewish allies and colleagues who are educating me on the painful history of anti-Semitic tropes. The social media firestorm came over the weekend after Omar tweeted that support for Israel stemmed from campaign donations, naming the pro-Israel lobbying group APAC. It does not give members of Congress campaign donations. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy said Omar's comments were unacceptable and he would take disciplinary action against her if Democrats did not act on their own. On Fox News, Representative Peter King called the comments shameful. To be suggesting that somehow members of Congress are being paid off by Jews, by AIPAC, that goes right into the anti-Semitic bias which has plagued the world for too long. This was Omar's second anti-Semitic tweet. She earlier apologized for tweeting in 2012 that Israel had hypnotized the world. Last month, Michigan Representative Rashida Tlaib also criticized Israel and members of Congress, saying they are more loyal to Israel than the United States. Senator Marco Rubio sponsors a bill that punishes companies participating in BDS, the Boycott, Divest and Sanctions movement against Israel. Both Omar and Tlaib support the BDS movement. Rubio suggests the Democrats don't know how to deal with new members of Congress who openly express anti-Semitic views. There's a growing group of people in the Democratic Party that are anti-Israel openly, and I think they're afraid of them. Democratic Party leaders may likely have more such political fires to put out in the months ahead, and that may play right into the hands of President Trump and the Republicans, who are likely to make Israel and anti-Semitism a campaign issue in next year's election. Gary Lane, CBN News. As I understand, that woman is on the prestigious Foreign Relations Committee, and to, to leave her on a committee like that, Nancy Pelosi needs to discipline her. It isn't enough to say, well, I'm offended by those remarks. The, the Republicans worked on their man very severely for doing something, in my opinion, wasn't as bad as what uh, uh, this woman has done. But this anti-Semitism, I mean, it's there. And uh, you, 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 you cannot have people who hate Jews and hate Israel and claim that they're running our country and, and buying off congressmen. This is just terrible. And she should be disciplined. But uh, it isn't enough to say, well, her remarks, her remarks offend me. What are you going to do about it, Nancy, Terry? Well, coming up, the search for a new way to manage pain has led back to an old technique, acupuncture. Some people think it helps highlight areas in the brain that decrease the sense of pain. There are lots of different hypotheses about why it works, but it has been proven to help. Hear about the benefits of acupuncture and see if it's right for you. That's next. Welcome to the 700 Club. I, I um, had the privilege of reading a, a few months ago an interesting book about a man who was called the Apostle of Pain. And he went all over America talking to doctors and telling doctors, you must not allow pain. You've got to keep your patients from experiencing pain. You can't have pain when there's surgery. You can't have this post-op pain, they do not need to experience pain because pain sets back the healing. And this man was bringing with him something that was called Oxycontin and the other uh, derivative, which is a heroin derivative called Oxycodone. Now, his company was called Purdue Pharma, Purdue Pharma, and then uh, it apparently the doctors began to prescribe uh, oxycontin and oxycodone to help their patients to alleviate pain. And what happened was one of the companies that was making this oxycontin began to send out millions of pills. And so there was a uh, so-called uh, alley of, of, of pharmacies down through Florida where prescriptions were being written for the thousands and thousands of pills. Pills were, be, pills were being shoved out into small rural communities like in West Virginia and Ohio by the millions. And a major company that makes these pills was bringing them out. 
So you say, how do we stop this thing? Because what's happened is these particular pills, <clears throat> it isn't like you're taking uh, uh, heroin, for example, or you're taking uh, uh, some other narcotic where you can go cold turkey. Uh, an addict to one of these uh, opioids can't stop because there's something that's happening in their brain and in order to stop, they have to be, there has to be a letdown process of something like methadone to uh, enable them to come off the stuff. But it's an epidemic that is destroying families, causing death and terrible harm. So people are, some doctors are beginning to say, well, if oxycontin and oxycodone and hydrocodone are causing all these problems, how do we alleviate pain? Well, there are ancient remedies, and our Laurie Johnson, who is a brilliant health reporter, is going to tell you about something that is an ancient remedy called acupuncture. Like millions of Americans, Kyle Miller struggles with constant pain. Stiffness, soreness, and discomfort in my back. And actually, for the first time ever, um, my back totally went out. This chronic pain is the kind that lasts three months or more. It could be chronic headaches, it could be chronic pelvic pain, which is common in both men and women. It could become low back pain, which is probably the most common. A complicating factor is that many doctors and patients are turning away from traditional treatment methods. But really we look, look at surgery is a last resort because it's not amazingly effective. A lot of people don't get relief from surgery. It's a lot to go through to have surgery. Anti-inflammatory medication called NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen can also cause problems. Taking those too much increases risk of heart disease, definitely increases the risk of, pe of peptic ulcer disease, causes other problems in the digestive tract. And there are also the many issues with prescription pain pills. Especially now with the opioid epidemic and not wanting to use opioid pain medicines, not wanting to get people addicted to pain medicines, there's a real push on what else we can do. That's why doctors are searching for new treatment options, such as acupuncture. It's very well respected for certain conditions, including back pain and many chronic painful conditions. There are very good studies proving its benefit. Some people think it helps highlight areas in the brain that decrease the sense of pain. There are lots of different hypotheses about why it works, but it has been proven to help. In fact, the American College of Physicians now backs acupuncture for treating low back pain. What I'd like to recommend for all my new patients is to try it first before you do anything else because it doesn't have any long-term negative side effects. I like to recommend at least five sessions for you to see some changes. And after five, you'll know if it's gonna work for you or not. Patients of acupuncturist Grace Sue's generally undergo 30-minute sessions once or twice a week. It helps by increasing circulation simply. And research shows that it increases something called nitric oxide, which has been shown to decrease inflammation, lower blood pressure, help with pain management. And yes, it means needles, but they're super thin. You barely feel anything. You definitely don't feel them really being inserted. It's not painful. And then, you know, you relax with the needles in for a few moments and it, it either feels like nothing or honestly, it puts me to sleep. She only inserts them into the skin's top layer. Very superficial, so we never go near the nerve or at the nerve. Although most of Grace's patients want pain relief, she also treats digestive problems, hormone issues, you name it. Believe it or not, acupuncture is often used for cosmetic purposes. I'm getting an anti-aging treatment that smooths fine lines and wrinkles. It's great for people who don't want to use injectables like Botox. Grace often treats people struggling with substance abuse, including sugar addiction. What I focus on is calming the nervous system down, relaxing the body, helping them sleep. Because if you are sleeping really well the night before, then the next day, your blood sugar is more managed, you're more relaxed, and therefore you'll make better choices. 
Whereas acupuncture pierces the skin in strategic spots, acupressure involves applying force to those areas. Massaging this part of the hand treats red, puffy eyes. Near the wrist, vomiting and nausea. And the middle of the forehead, stress and headaches. So whether you take matters into your own hands or go to a professional, stimulating the body's natural ability to fight pain and other problems could help you avoid issues from other treatments. Gloria, it's amazing. You know, my wife and I were in China, and we saw a woman who was getting ready. I think she was having surgery, and they were doing acupuncture. And my wife held her hand. It was filthy dirty. It was just, you know, but they were sticking those needles in, and apparently they took away the pain. But they were talking about yang and yang and all these body forces. But are there, there are junctures which if you can hit one of those junctures, you can alleviate some of the pressure that builds up? Absolutely, and uh, that's Eastern medicine that had been around for centuries, as you mentioned. Yeah. Then Westerners are like, hey, acupuncture works, but we're not sure about that explanation that they use. So yeah. they started researching it, and a more scientific Western explanation. Well, what is the Western is, explanation? It is that it um, decreases your muscle tension and increases the body's natural production of endorphins. Oh. Endorphins are our God-given pain reliever. Sure. They're very powerful, as powerful as opioids. They actually stimulate the opioid receptors in our bodies. You don't have to have acupuncture to, to get the endorphins going. You can have vigorous exercise does it too, and we hear about the runner's high, yeah. Yeah. and that feeling of euphoria. That's the same thing that Is people experience with well, the opioids. You know, there was an acupressure and they say on feet, there's somebody, you know, had something that you push this one and it helps your kidney, and you push something else and it helps your liver and all right, that. Right, right. Is that true? Well, the the more simple, there it gets very complicated, but a very simple acupressure technique that has been shown to work is you... Uh, you put your thumb next to your index finger and a little bit of skin pops up there. That's the area you want to really press down on both sides. Really press hard yeah, for about 10 seconds to up to a minute. And it does really help relieve all kinds of anxiety and pain. And then also here on the wrist, this has really been shown to help women who have morning sickness and mm -hmm. nausea or people who are experiencing motion sickness. But again, with the acupuncture, they noticed that it stimulates circulation yeah. which produces, uh, helps us to, uh, you know, accelerate the production of what's called nitric oxide. Oh, yeah. Nitric knocks. oxide yeah, is, um, again, God-given, and it's called a vasodilator. Vaso right. meaning vascular, dilating mm -hmm. mean gets bigger. So that means our blood vessels get bigger. So it reduces our blood pressure, which is the number one cause of stroke. It also reduces anxiety and reduces inflammation. Another way that we can stimulate not nitric oxide is by breathing through our nose, because when we breathe in, our sinuses make nitric oxide. Oh, yeah. So if you ever are stressed out and need, you know, to calm down, breathe through your nose yeah. really big to fill up your lungs so that that, um, that that oxygen gets to all your muscles and your brain. Mm -hmm. And it's a great technique. We should always be breathing through our nose, deep breaths through our nose all the time to stimulate that nitric oxide well, because know, when we breathe through our mouths, I'm, it, it bypasses the sinuses. I'm some serious weightlifting. And uh, any weightlifter wants knocks. I mean, you, 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 we knocks. Don't. Yeah, you, <laughs> is, you that what, is that what you guys it, call it in the gym? Knocks, absolutely. Knocks. All I right, mean, never and, heard and it called knocks. So, so you, you get stuff to, to get knocks, and then there there are various vitamins and things you can get to build up knocks uh, in you, and it's 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 extremely beneficial for for muscle development. Mm -hmm. But you know, I had a big performance horse. I don't have any horses now, but I used to have big, uh, great big uh, a horse that was used for dressage. And we had an acupuncturist that come in about once a week, and she would put little pins in that horse, and he would, you know, all of a sudden, he would lower his head, and they'd sigh, and he was so relieved, and all the pressure was taken away. That, that was the happiest horse, I mean, in performance. Huh. I mean, he, we had a, acupuncture. Now that's you that's, didn't know that's that? new to me. <laughs> we had we had a I had a, a, a chiropractor. I had an acupuncturist. I had a tooth doctor. I mean, that was the most expensive horse you. Could have.
Well, but you he, take, you he take was, really good care of your horses. But that rascal could really perform. I mean, when he was, if you loosened up, he would, but you ask him to do things, and, and they, if they're all stiff. But as I heard, there were some junctures uh, in the nerves uh, that were blocking, and that they'd hit them with these little needles, and they would open up those pathways. Is that true? Right, yes, and placement is so very important. Yeah. So folks, don't do acupuncture at home. Acupressure, yes, but you need to go to a, a certified acupuncturist, preferably somebody who's been doing it for four years, get recommendations, and interview them. Interview three or four or two or three to see if they're sort of like on the same plane as you. But, you know, you talk about going to acupuncturists for pain. The number one cause of pain is back pain. Mm -hmm. And the number one reason people have back pain is being overweight. Uh. God made our spines perfectly. He's a perfect engineer, but only to withstand a certain amount of weight, just like sure. an elevator or a plane or a ship. Yeah. Too much weight causes catastrophe. Another main reason people have back pain is because the muscles surrounding the spine are too weak. Again, yeah. God made us to move. Uh -huh. Movement builds muscles, but too many of us are sedentary. So there are some exercises people can do, and I would invite them to go to our website, cbnnews.com, and I did a little eight-minute oh. demonstration oh, of all these good. exercises to build the muscles around your spine to prevent injury. And these are things like your, your hip flexors, uh -huh. your abs, your back, your glutes. Those are muscles, too. Those all protect the lower back especially. So that's on our website. And these are exercises you can do at home. Well, I've, I've tried. You know, sit-ups used to be the thing that they see. I, I read that Britney Spears did a... 500 of them, so I decided that she did 500, I could do 300, so I did 300 sit-ups just to see if I could do it. So you're in competition with Britney Spears. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I think that kind of, you know, sit-ups don't really do much for you. There, there are other things that you can do to build up your uh, your uh, stomach muscles, your abs. Yeah, they call it the core the because core. it's everything right. surrounding your spine, including the lower portions and your upper well, portions. You, you, lie, you can there's some leg raises you can do and, mm -hmm. and flutter kicks and all yeah. that stuff. That's and and um, I'm demonstrating all those. I went to the Y and got one of these specialists, one of these weightlifting specialists at the Y yeah. to teach me. And so you can see me doing them. So if I can do it, you can do it. They're very yeah. easy. And one other thing about preventing injury preventing back injury in particular is balance. Mm -hmm. So we should be practicing balance. Just stand on stand on one foot. Sometimes you might need to hold the wall, mm -hmm. but try to get to the point where you don't need to hold the wall, then you can get even more complicated standing on one foot and bending over. But you know, building well, balance and keeping balance, that's a great way to prevent injury. Back to this uh, acupuncture stuff, the the Chinese use it in 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 place of uh, anesthesia. I mean, they actually operate with people under the influence of uh, acupuncture. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. It is, and I've actually seen I've seen. Uh somebody I know personally who was um, struggling with incredible foot pain, uh -huh. and I saw an acupuncturist work on her foot, and it went away. Well, that's, that's uh, so whatever, but forget the yin and yang part, but just realize there is some serious medicine. And uh, what else is coming? You've got some more things coming. We've got Dr. Axe coming in a couple of days with all that. We're Dr. Axe is going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is collagen. By the way, acupuncture has been uh, shown to increase collagen production oh, and boy. elastin. You remember how I was talking on the piece yeah. about, um, you know, you can use it to get rid of the, the 11s, these two lines here, uh -huh. and then the horizon line there, um, because it stimulates uh, collagen, which keeps our skin tight and elastin, but collagen also helps keep our gut healthy. We all know how important that is. <laughs> and then it's also really good for the joints. So yeah, collagen, lots of different ways to get collagen. I, I tell you, I've got Dr. Perlmutter and his stuff about wheat, and I've got somebody else about something else. There's My head is spinning with all these theories. I thought we had it down pretty cold on the gut floor. I, <laughs> that seemed to be, that made a lot of sense, and boy, that people was, loved it. That was Health 101. Now we're taking an advanced <laughs> course. <laughs> Always more to learn. And you know that the thing about it is, in ancient times, in, in biblical times, for example, all these things came naturally. Yeah. You know, they, they, they didn't have to think about going to the gym. They walked all the time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have to think about, you know, staying away from sugar and processed food. There was none. Yeah. 
So uh, now we have to make the effort. Okay. Well, anyhow, Laura is going to tell you more in another on this program. Another couple of days, we've got Doctor. Uh, what does he call it? Ancient nutrition or whatever. Uh, but anyhow, we'll find out about that. But uh, Laura hosts her health living program on the CBN News Channel. It airs Tuesday nights at 9:30 Eastern, and you can see it and. Learn how you can be healthy, wealthy, and hopefully wise. Mm -hmm. All right, Laurie, thank you. God bless you. My pleasure. God bless you. All right, Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, there's more than one Robertson that's not afraid to speak his mind. The head of the Duck Dynasty family challenges some of the lies being spread throughout our culture when we return. Well, here's a free piece of advice. Listen to a guy who knows how to use a shotgun. And now Phil Robertson isn't just blasting the feathers of anything that quacks. He's blasting the secular ideas that he thinks are ruining America. In 1966, Time magazine asked, is God dead? Since then, basic beliefs in marriage, gender identity, and the value of life have been shaken to the core. Phil Robertson is a best-selling author and the founder of the Duck Commander Company. He says the bad news in our country is really bad. But in his book, The Theft of America's Soul, Phil says the good news is really good. He blows the lid off the lies that are destroying America and offers 10 truths that could turn our nation around. Well, the show was called Duck Dynasty. It had a huge audience in the family of people with beards and ducks and uh, everything down in Louisiana is back on the air. And Phil Robertson, who's the patriarch of that clan, and his lovely wife, Kay, are with us now. I'm so glad to see you both. I'm glad honored to be you're here. here. Hey, Phil, let me ask you, you lived a pretty rough life. You were, you played for LSU, you were half back on the- Louisiana Tech. Yeah. Louisiana. Louisiana Tech. Oh, Louisiana, not, not LSU, Louisiana Tech. You played halfback. You were good. You, you were quarterback. Qu you were quarterback. I was the quarterback right ahead of Terry Bradshaw. Oh, I, okay. He was second string, and I told him, I said, I think I'm going to go chase ducks instead of play, play football. I said, Bradshaw, I just really don't see a good ending with a livelihood that involves large, violent men chasing you. <laughs> I said, <laughs> large, violent men chasing you. So Bradshaw went on to the professional football world, and, and you, I, I went after the ducks. Well, you, you had a duck call. How would you get to come up with that thing? It's like uh, playing music by ear. Yeah. You, you hear these birds. And God made a, an array of ducks. Okay. Well, they all have different sounds. All right. Some of them just peep, and some of them quack. All right. So I figured out, listening to them, how to build devices that sounded like each species. So once I got that going and on the market, it didn't start out fast. My first year sales, Pat, were eight thousand dollars. That's we sold eight thousand dollars worth. I said, Miss Kay. We are rolling. Yeah, you, and Terry Brass said. Yeah. She said, we're going to starve to death. Yeah. I did. <laughs> well, you lived a pretty rough life. You were a, a bouncer. You beat somebody up in a bar. What did you do? Yeah, I, was, I lived I was through a, that, too. I was a heathen. You were? And I didn't find out about Jesus and investigate him. I do have two degrees from Louisiana Tech. But Pat, in, the, in an eight-year period, Earning those degrees, I never heard anyone say one kind word about Jesus. Mm. Not one. Yeah. So I guess I came out of there at best an agnostic, mm -hmm. but I don't even think I, I was a believer at all. Well, you know. I investigated Jesus at 28 years old, and I thought, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. We're talking life and immortality here. Yeah, that's right. So that's well, what got my attention. first? Huh? Who found Jesus? Miss Kay found oh, Jesus found first. Him. Oh, what, a what year you? ahead of him. How come you 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 found? Well, him? I was at. Well, I got to that place where there was no hope with the marriage. I just thought, what can I do? I'm trying to be the best wife 
be the best mother. I tried to make everything right, and he just kept messing it all up. <laughs> what did he do? Mike got drunk and, you know, just lived like a heathen. So, I mean, I guess one night I came in, and, and I was just at the bottom. I mean, I really wanted to just go to sleep and not wake up. Mm. And uh, what saved me, you'll love this, is my oldest son was about eight or nine, I can't remember, and him and the other boys were outside the bathroom when I was crying in the bathroom, mm -hmm. thinking I just don't know what to do. I don't have any hope. Yeah. And that's all I wanted was to be a good wife and mother. That was my goal in life. And I felt like I just failed. So Alan said, Mama, don't cry anymore. God's going to help us. Yeah. I mean, he's a little child from the... Can you yeah, believe that? Yeah, yeah. And he, say, he said now, since he was a preacher for 25 years, he said, that was my first sermon, and my mom responded. <laughs> <laughs> so he's still preaching. Pat, my woman tells me now, she says, Phil, and I mentioned this early when we were on Facebook, she said, uh, I've been poor with you, and you were mean. Yeah. She said, now... I'm rich with you, and you're very kind. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so he's kind now. Uh, he's, he's very kind. He, he waits on me when I got sick. Uh -huh. He took care of me. I mean, he didn't even bat an eye. He brought me a trail of food every day. I mean, he took care of me for the whole time, I, like three months that I was sick. Isn't that beautiful? I learned it all from the Almighty. Yes, you did. Well, you know, you, you all uh, uh, had a... Uh, Tremendous experience. So you, you were, you, this TV show, how did that come about? It was so popular. It just exploded all across America. They came down from New York, and someone came up with a wild idea. Somebody stood up in the back at one of those skull sessions they were having, those producers uh, for A&E, uh -huh. and someone said, I know this is a far-fetched idea, but... Why don't we maybe have a functional family on television? <laughs> oh, yeah. And Not someone perfect. else, yeah, yeah, someone else said, you know, Dave, that's a wild idea, but where would you find one? <laughs> yeah. So they came all the way down to Louisiana, Louisiana yeah. down on the riverbank, and for a godly group, family group, and they said, let's give it a try. After they pitched the idea and left, uh, my sons, four sons and their wives, they said, Dad, what do you think? I said, a bunch of rednecks shooting ducks. I said, yeah. I just don't think that's going to work in America. Yeah. I said, however, I said, what if God's behind it? I wow. said, it'll go ballistic. Yeah. Well, as it turned out, it went I said, why don't we just see? So we started the show, and from that, Pat, Oh, thousands and thousands have been converted to Christ via that TV show. Well, it's been so wonderful. And people just lived with your family. They loved you both. They, they all your children. And it was amazing. People are still coming down and visiting us. Yeah. We give them the gospel. Jesus and and a lot on. of good food. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You. What kind of food do you, you concentrate on these days? Well, I do two or three types. I do the country meals, which is like chicken and dumplings. Yeah. Or fried chicken or things that were, you know, you associate with the South. Uh-huh. And I do a lot of those meals. Or sometimes they want Cajun food. Uh -huh. So we get it all the way from the Gulf. I've got somebody that goes down and gets it and, at a market there. And we cook shrimp and crawfish and all that. We make that really good. He makes gumbos, and we make all that. And then the next choice would be just steak. Mm -hmm. And we and sometimes he cooks a whole ribeye on our grill. Wow. So we have that. So we have three different choices. And you have your families all together. I mean, it's really nice that people all eat this together. That's, that's that's right. And for all the naysayers who say, "Oh, you shouldn't eat meat," I'm like. I have Acts chapter 10 where the big sheet was let down out of heaven for Peter to see. That's right. <laughs> Let's see, four-footed animals, that'd be your deer, moose, elk, buffalo, and it also contained birds of the air, which are your ducks. Yeah. And then the creatures that move along the ground and the voice from headquarters says, Arise, Peter, kill, kill and eat. So, Pat, we got orders from headquarters. <laughs> if it walks... 
crawls, flies, or swims, <laughs> whack them and stack them. <laughs> Let me talk about this book. This, Phil, your knowledge of the Bible, I must say, is encyclopedia. This, this is the uh, theft of America's soul. How'd you learn the Bible? I mean, you've got scripture from the Psalms in here that's unbelievable. He's memorized so much you wouldn't believe. Have you really? I looked at the text. Yeah, he has. He won't admit I, it. And as I read them, one thing stood out. It was what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 5. Mm -hmm. He said, solid food, these scriptures, we ingest them through our ears yeah. that goes into our heart. Uh -huh. Solid food is for the mature yeah. who by constant use, constant use, have yeah. trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Right. Well, really that's the basis of my life. When I ran up on Jesus, I just couldn't get enough of it because I was thinking, how in the world did I miss this? And I need to be more productive and sharing my faith and reaching out to my fellow man. So, so that's what the book's all about. What do you see? You said the theft of America. So what do you think's happened to America? I would simply look back at what the Apostle Paul told the church at Rome. Mm -hmm. Roman Empire at its heyday, right. a vast superpower of that day. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul said, since they did not think it worthwhile mm -hmm. to retain the knowledge of God, right. God gave them over to a depraved right. mind to do what ought not to be done. Right. Then he has this list. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy. Listen to this, murder. Mm -hmm. You're like, the Roman Empire was full of murder. Well, if you look at what the Roman Empire were doing and you fast forward 2,000 years, their gossips, slanderers, God-haters, mm -hmm. insolent, arrogant, boastful, I'm quoting here. That's right. And he says, they invent ways of doing evil. Yeah. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. They'll rip their children out of their wombs mm -hmm. and sell their body parts. You're like, what in the world are you doing? Yeah. That, that's your son, your daughter. Yeah. So reading those texts, I said, I, I, I at least need to remind of America, none of those sins has changed in the last 2,000 years really since Paul addressed the Roman Empire. They're all the same, Pat. They're mm -hmm. still the same. So, unless America repents of this evil that they are involved in right now, you're not going to believe what this thing is going to look like in another 20, 30 years. What do, you, what do you think is coming? I think the wrath of God is coming. That's what I think. You do? Do you go along with that too? You believe it? Yeah, I, I think it's so sad. See, I was raised by my grandmother, but I live with her half the time. Mm -hmm. And she was always teaching me in just a simple, common way, you know? I mean, we'd be shelling peas, and she would just be talking to me about the Bible and about being good. And it, it is far more important, the inside of you, than the outside. And all those lessons, she just did it day by day by day. And uh, I had such a rock there. Now, my mother was an alcoholic, mm. and all they worked all the time. My mom and dad, they had a grocery store. But I just saw such goodness in her, and she didn't just say it. She did it. She took food to people. She uh, took flowers to people. You know, she was always serving, too. Just She put it in action. And yet she only went to school till she was 13. But she was... Uh, you know, I learned that. Uh -huh. And that's why I never had any trouble because she taught to love all people, no matter what color or anything like uh -huh. that. So I was so different from a lot of the people back in the, oh, you know, yeah, 40s, yeah. 50s, you know, when I was being raised. But yeah, I think that I just see such, um, such not, they just don't want to talk about God and they want to live their own life and just 
so selfish and self-centered. You know, we, we've, we've aborted about 60 million unborn babies, and they, you're exactly right, talking about selling body parts. And, you know, that governor of Virginia said, well, if, if a little child is born a little bit deformed, we'll keep him comfortable till we decide, you know, how to kill him. I mean, that was pretty shocking stuff. Yeah. Their feet are swift to shed innocent blood. That's right. Swift to shed innocent blood. And there is no fear of God in their eyes. They say, we've done nothing wrong. Listen to this, Pat. Go ahead. Here's a scary read. Mark this. Paul is talking to Timothy. Mark this down. Yeah. There will be terrible times in the last days. <clears throat> People will be lovers of themselves, mm -hmm. lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love. Mm. If you kill your own offspring, Pat, it's There's not, not an ounce of love in you. There's something wrong, isn't it? These, yeah. without love, unforgiving, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't even give, they came to Jesus and said, how many times do we forgive somebody, yeah. Lord, seven when they seven. sin against us? Seven, he said, 70 times seven. That's right. That's we won't even forgive anyone once. That's right. Unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, all the drugs. Our own nephew, my nephew, my sister's boy, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pat got hooked up on this, these opioids. Right. My nephew hanged himself in his jail cell. Oh, Phil. 52 years My old. own nephew. Horrible. College graduate, LSU, CPA, had a wonderful job, lost it all, including his life, and hanged himself with his own shirt in a jail cell. So when you read about this, lovers of pleasure, conceited, rash, treacherous, lovers, uh, not lovers of the good and not lovers of God. So when you read that text, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's, it's, that's where the book came from. I just was reading these texts and I said, you know, I at least need to help my fellow man and remind oh, them of these I things. Think it's magnificent. It's called The Theft of America's Soul, Phil Robertson, and uh, it's available wherever books are sold, and uh, it's, it's uh, blowing the lid off the lies that are destroying our country, and it's available. And uh, I hope it's a bestseller. I'm sure it won't be. You know what is, <coughs> tell them what? what your goal is. What's it? To tell them to love God. You know, the one you say. This is his goal. I always remind them. Uh, hey, America, what's the downside? What is the downside of loving God yeah. and loving each other? Mm -hmm. I just, for the life of me, do, do not see the downside, <laughs> Pat. Not, How hard could it be? <laughs> That's his There's plenty point. of downside on the other, though, Phil. I guarantee you it is. God bless you both. You all are terrific. And folks, you know, appreciate these people and if you ever watched Duck Dynasty, it was a smashing uh, show and, and, and won the awards time after time. This family down in Louisiana, the Duck Dynasty. But uh, we'll be back with more of the 700 Club. I'm trying to answer some of your questions right after this. The book is called The Theft of America's Soul. God bless you both. Thank you. That's great. Wow. So true. We want to take a few minutes to answer some of the questions you sent in. And Pat, this first email comes from a viewer who asks, how do some churches and denominations believe that God never considered homosexuality a sin? I'm curious what biblical backing they have. Well, they, they don't have any biblical backing. They just don't believe the Bible. Um, the Bible is very clear. I mean, I know in, in Proverbs it said it's, it's a sin for a man to lie with a man like with a woman. But you read Romans, it said, Wherefore God gave them up to ungodly uh, passions, and men lusting after men, and women after, and left the natural function and, and burned after women. And wherefore God gave them up. I mean, it's so clear that this is the, the last uh, uh, sign in a declining civilization, the riot of blatant homosexuality. 
There's no question about it. So, I mean, if churches don't teach that, they're, they're just doing something wrong. But, you know, now I saw one of the questions that they, they have now for teachers in, I think, New York and others, you've got to say, could you sell the, the uh, uh, contributions to society that came out of the LGBT uh, transgender stuff? And uh, these children are being sensitized toward homosexuality when they're in the first and second grades. So, I mean, but it's the last sign, according to the Bible, of the decline of a civilization. And it's in there. Look at Romans. It's, it's real clear. Okay. This is Brian who says, I know God says we need to tithe. If we choose to give to Christian organizations instead of a church, does that count as our tithe? Well, of course it does. I, I think, you know, I could start a church. Terry and I could have the church of the happy people. <laughs> and and we could have and it would be <laughs> yeah we, and and we could say well we we claim your tithes yes but I mean how about orphans promise that's reaching millions of people wouldn't that be better how how about the operation blessing how about CBN and others the church is big and I think when we give we're giving unto the Lord and it doesn't I, I know a lot of people get mad at me because they, they, I had a, 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 one of our co-hosts who said the the tithe belongs to the church well. We are the church. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, this is uh, Joe who wants to know, can you explain the difference between the rapture and the second coming, and how will the rapture happen? All right. Uh, th there's a teaching that uh, these uh, uh, people brought forth from the uh, uh, people in the 18th and the 19th century about this rapture. The idea was that uh, there's going to be uh, a catching up of the believers and then seven years after that, the Lord's going to come back. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says, you know, the Lord will descend from the heaven with a shout of command, and the trump of God and the dead of Christ will rise. That's the rapture. And it's when Jesus comes back again, we will rise to be with him in the air. And those of us who are alive will not precede those who are dead. All right. Well, today's power minute is from John. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Thank you so much for being with us. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will, Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.